Yes. Uh, yeah. Arunduti, please go ahead. Should I begin now? Yes, yes, Arunduti. Am I watching? Yes, you are. A very hearty good evening to one and all present here. I'm Arunduti, a student at TESS, today bestowed with the opportunity to welcome you all to yet another enriching session with Cultural Studies Research Forum. C CSRF inaugurated on April 13, 2021 under the umbrella of TESS. It's a non-profit enterprise largely operated by student initiatives and inspired by our very own Dr. Kalyani Wallach Ma'am. CSRF is an innovative approach towards promotion of cultural research. It provides offline and online platforms where aspiring scholars are able to interact and develop their critical thinking. CSRF is a happening place to understand and experience our rich cultural diversity so as to venture into the untapped creative narratives in cultural studies. From new literatures to academic research, from burgeoning literary narratives to latest theories and terminologies, from poetry to dance and music, from sports to food. Here at CSRF, we are striving to blur the boundaries between various aspects of life that we know as culture and literature. And we are attempting to reclassify the term culture itself. Apart from intellectually grueling discussions, CSRF is also known for enhancing communication skills and content writing among its members so that we are able to better express our creative talents. Our thirst for research is further ignited by flying subject experts that grace CSRF with, our, with their seasoned ideas from time to time. Today, we have among us one such ingenious and unconventional scholar, Dr. Rakesh Ramamurthy, sir. He is Assistant Professor, Department of English at Mar Avanyos College, Tiruvannantapuram. Dr. Ramamurthy, sir, is among us to talk on the subject, New Playing Fields for English Literature, Cricket, Empire, and Cultural Studies. He is a revered pedagogue in academia and is often invited as guest in University of Kerala and other prestigious institutions across our country. Dr. Ramamurthy's doctoral research studies select cricket narratives from India and Pakistan from cultural perspective. He has been publishing articles and book reviews on cricket narratives in many national and international journals. He has been representing his work in conferences and is also working as an editor and co-editor for textbooks such as Frontiers of Communication, The Canterville Ghost by Oscar Wilde, etc. Quite evidently, he is a prolific scholar and naturally working on a book project that examines the intersectionality between cricket and life titles. Cricket is a religion for Indian subcontinent. It has the potential to transcend beyond our national and religious consciousness. In time, the sports has developed a culture of its own. That being said, I now request Dr. Ramamurthy sir to enlighten us with his playful narrative of cricket studies, pun intended. Over to you, sir, and a hearty welcome from all of Cultural Research members. Welcome, sir. Uh, hi, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, very much. Uh, thank you, thank you for that uh, warm uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you very much for the very enthusiastic invitation to be a part of this. It's a pleasure and an honor. Okay, uh, so let me get into this without much further ado. At some point, if I'm uh, if something is not clear, there's an audio disruption, uh, please uh, let me know uh, because then I will just once I get into the flow, uh, I won't realize all right uh, because I've had experience of you no, know, we all have experience of uh, teaching in online classes where we have had technical issues and then you know we kept on speaking. <laughs> for a couple of minutes without realizing. Okay, uh, let me just share a slide. That I uh, is the slide visible for you? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir.
I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I, I'm hoping it's visible, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is visible. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, today I'm not going to uh, speak about anything very uh, difficult or very profound, but I'm hoping it will be uh, of some amount of interest. So uh, when you look at the title, uh, there is obviously the cricket, the cricket there, there is the empire there. But interestingly enough, there is also something about the cultural Eastern and what English, English literature students do, what do they usually study? So uh, today, uh, what I would do, what I hope to do is not just to speak about uh, cricket and the empire, but to discuss why we should study something like cricket. So uh, this lecture is in one sense about the culture is turned in the domain of literary studies, broadly defined, by using cricket as a case study. So uh, in for the first three, four minutes, I'll be speaking about something very basic, but I believe it's very important. This is the question that, that I would like to start off with. Why should we, as students of humanities, students of literature, film studies, whatever, combat literature, why should we, students of humanities, be interested in something like cricket? Not just cricket, food cultures, the whole uh, politics of a shopping mall or even a supermarket. Why is it that these days scholars in the humanities are interested in something like this? Obviously, this is not new to us. I'm not suggesting that, that this is something very novel. But I do believe it's useful to go back to the basics for a minute. See, this is an idea that I start most of my you know, lectures of this sort with. Not most, all in fact. Because it's not that people don't know it, it's not that students don't know it, but they rarely approach cultural studies with a very clear evidence, very clear awareness of what is at stake of why they are studying a particular subject. Our pedagogic systems inevitably lead us into certain blind tunnels of inquiry. These days, students study film studies and Kerala studies just the way many students used to study romantic literature two or three decades ago. I'm not generalizing. But many students tend to do it. Now, the point that I want to raise is we should always start off with a question to ourselves as to what is culture. And we are all aware of the tradition of excellent work in cultural studies on the definition of culture, the, the difficulty in defining culture, etc. etc. Of course, all that is very valuable, but I would say it's always very useful to remember that the best way to understand culture is as the antonym of nature, is as the opposite of nature. And that, of course, leads us to the fact that nature only encompasses a very small percentage of our existence. The black pig, the black color of a cat or a human being is natural. The superstitious belief that a black cat is unlucky is cultural. Obviously, racism, the idea that a dark tone individual is inferior is cultural. So one simplistic but useful way of understanding culture would be to just think of, just 
keep this in mind that culture is the domain of meaning. When we human beings attribute meaning to culture, meaning to nature, it moves into the realm of culture. Now, the, the good thing about thinking about culture this way is that it makes us very conscious of the fact that it is human beings who attribute these meanings. Therefore, it follows that those meanings can be, and in many cases should be contested. So culture is the realm of meaning making and is the site of contestation of a meaning making. I hope these are, these are very basic. I'm sure everybody's you know, on the same page as far as these things are concerned. But the reason why I've been into this is just raise this question. Do I study cricket for cricket's sake? What one young but remarkable scholar, contemporary remarkable scholar on Indian cricket, once titled one of his Shavik Naha, Dr. Shavik Naha of University of Glasgow, once uh, titled one of his lectures, Why I am not a cricket historian. His point was that he is a historian of modern India. And he examines modern India frequently through the lens of cricket. So he is not a cricket historian. He is a historian who happens to adopt, who happened to adopt cricket as a case study on many occasions. So I brought this up because when I tell people over the past several years, when I tell people that I work on cricket, people immediately assume that I'm a cricket fan. And people compliment me on working on cricket as opposed to working on something more dry, such as postmodern novel. But for me, cricket is as serious a subject of study as any work of literature. I have a certain amount of interest in the sport, of course, but that is not why I study cricket. It's not like someone who researches food would be a glutton. Or we can't really say that someone who is working on uh, funeral rites is some sort of a sadist who enjoys death. No, that's not how research works. So, so I you start, start with this example, this particular line of thought, because it can help us clarify our own thinking about what exactly does it mean when we say that we have moved from literary studies into cultural studies. The idea is not that we no longer study literature and that we would now study sartorial cultures, cyber cultures, or sporting cultures alone because big fat novels are too boring. No, that's not the rationale at all. Within my limited and humble understanding, the logic is that we can't really be students of literature alone. We can be students of human societies. We can be students of various cultures. And literature is one among a wider matrix of cultural formations. And we can't really do any sort of effective research or academic inquiry if we are focusing solely on one of the domains as if all these compartments are watertight. So I study cricket and this is the point that I will end my lecture with as well. I study cricket because it is impossible to understand several domains and periods of culture such as Victorian England, 20th century England, contemporary England, post-colonial South Asia, the Caribbean, post-colonial Caribbean, Australia, over the course of the 20th century and even the 21st century. 
we can't study any of these cultures without being cognizant of the fact that cricket was a vital component of the public cultures of all these societies. So that is what I would like to start off with. So uh, I'll be speaking about these three things. Uh, I mean, for one second, let me just fix something here. Just give me one minute and stop. Sorry about that. <laughs> like, uh, let me just share this thing. All right. So uh, this is the batting order or the outline. All right. Uh, I'll first speak about cricket and the empire, cricket Englishness and the empire, the Victorians. That's what I'll be mostly speaking about uh, because of time constraints. And I'll also be briefly touching upon cricket and postcolonial writing back and globalization and the new hierarchies, new imperial hierarchies of world cricket. Okay. So when we speak about cricket and the empire, the fundamental point is that cricket was a crucial aspect. Cricket was a crucial domain in which the very idea of Englishness was forged over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. And this idea of Englishness was a form of imperial Englishness. One in which Englishness was seen as an identity that was suitable for imperial heroes. So uh, I will look at four main aspects based upon very solid academic work by great scholars. So I'll look at the link between cricket and imperial Englishness. Then there is very important trope wherein cricket was seen as a very effective training tool for imperial heroes. The link between cricket and civilizing mission and cricket and racial authority. I'll come to all these one by one. So, uh, firstly, the sport of cricket started acquiring the status of a sort of a national pastime, of a sort of uh, a national sport in England over the course of the 18th century. That's it, typing mistake on my part, not the 19th century, 18th century. And it's stretched over in the 19th century. Uh, see, cricket in in 17th in the 17th century used to be a rural sport that was fairly unruly. And like many other sports, 
cricket was associated frequently with gambling. There is a lot of evidence of tracks, religious tracks, which warn the flock against playing at cricket because it, it, would, it would lead you towards vices. Cricket matches would occasionally become sites of violence. But over the course of the 18th century, cricket went about a transformation. And that is because by that time, cricket had become a sport that was frequented, that was patronized equally, that was uh, played equally by the aristocrats and upper middle classes and the lower classes. So, the 18th century was a period when the English political culture itself became more uh, refined in a sense. Dominic Malcolm's book, uh, Globalizing Cricket, which I have indicated, which I have shown there, right, uh, from right there, is a brilliant work, which has looked at how, looked at the transformation in cricket using the lens of figurational sociology, looking at it in terms of the civilizing process, alias the civilizing process. So uh, after the bloodless revolution in 1688, English political culture went, went through a sort of parliamentarization. The parliament became more and more powerful. So uh, the English politics became less susceptible to armed conflict in inner armed conf inner conflicts that were that are violent. And these same upper classes were champions of cricket as well. And, the, and cricket became, went through several transformations as a result of which it became more of a non-violent game, non-violent game which was carried out with minimal contact. And it is at this point that I should offer a very important clarification as to the whole genesis of the term cricket as a gentleman's game. That has got nothing to do with the qualities of cricket. That is actually indicative of a particular class affiliation. Because uh, by the time, by the turn of the century, by the, by the early 19th century, two class of people used to play cricket. Amateurs who had other jobs, that would mostly be lords and various kinds of aristocrats, and professionals would be paid to play. So the amateurs came to be known as gentlemen because every year the Marylebone Cricket Club, which was the English cricket board at that point, MCC, would conduct this annual derby match every year titled the gentlemen versus the players. The amateurs were gentlemen and the players were the professionals. That was a very clear class hierarchy wherein the captaincy of the team would always go to the gentlemen. And uh, the, and there was, even within the game, the gentlemen would, would favor batting and the more plebeian task of bowling was considered to be the traditional preserve of the players. So within the playing fields of the 19th century England, the gentlemen and players would eat, dine separately, they would enter and leave the playing field through different gates. And in the scoreboard, the initials would precede the names of the amateurs. And initials would follow the names of the amateurs in uh, the case of, uh, initials would follow the names of the professionals. So now the one might think that the start of an status of an amateur would mean that they won't take money. 
But all it meant was that they had other jobs. Professionals would have taken cricket as their profession and they would receive fixed match fees. Amateurs, the concept was that amateurs do not really accept a wage for playing, but they could still claim expenses. In practice, most amateurs would make more money out of cricket than the professionals because they would, they would claim and be given very high sums as expenses, as reimbursement of supposed expenses. So in cricket, within the context of cricket, gentlemen obviously meant the upper classes. Obviously the word gentlemen is a genteel, gentility refers to uh, an elite class status. So uh, cricket in 19th century England was a game that was known as gentleman's game because they believed that cricket embodied certain virtues. Virtues such as the stiff upper lip, the, the, the proverb is stiff upper lip, the British general, English gentleman's ability to face crisis without showing emotion. Stiff upper lip, uh, courageousness, uh, you know, obe obedience to authority, leadership quality, etc., etc. And the idea was that gentlemen are more refined, and cricket reflects those ideas. Whereas in practice, if you if we go back to the first, if you to my title slide, the two people I have put there, the one on the right, you are likely to recognize more easily, that is Ranjit Singh Ji, an Indian prince who became a legendary English cricketer. He played for England, not for India, in the 19th century. It's after him that we have named Rinji Trophy. The man on the left was the only person who had a greater claim to cricketing fame in Nigeria, England. That is William Gilbert Grace, W.G. Grace, who played professional, not professional, who played cricket for over 50 years, considered to be the greatest cricketer ever by the conservative cricketing firmament. Grace was the most well-known gentleman, most well-known amateur ever. But he was also, he was a remarkable cricketer, of course, but he was also well-known for, uh, for his indulgence in various kinds of cheating, where he would browbeat the umpire into letting him play only even after he's out. Very famously, he, when an umpire tried to argue with him, saying he's out. He said, all these people have turned up to see me bat. No one is here to see you umpire. That is, and his stature was so much that his word prevailed. So anyway, my point is that, so cricket by the 19th century had acquired an association with a particular class identity. And it supposedly embodied a particular kind of Englishness. And there is a lot of writing which played a role, cricketing discourses that played a role in constructing a particular sort of Englishness. This is a very famous passage from uh, Reverend James Spycroft's The Cricket Field, which was published in 1854. He says, the game of cricket philosophically considered is a standing panegyric on the English character. Panegyric means a sort of a song of praise, celebrated song. So it's a celebration or it's a, it's, a, it's a beacon of English character. That's what they say. None but an orderly and sensible race of people would so amuse themselves. See? Cricket, the game itself reflects well on the English character. It's a proof of the virtue of Englishness. Why? Only an orderly, look at that word, orderly. In that, they are refined, they are civilized. 
Will an orderly list of people would play such a game? Leaving a few lines towards the end. He says, as to the as to physical qualifications, we require not only the volatile spirits of the Irishman rampant, nor the phlegmatic caution of the Scotchman cochant, but we want the English combination of the two. See, this is the tussle between Englishness and Britishness. He says, cricket embodies the best of Britishness, which is equal to Englishness. Because England is first among the equals among other British nations. So it is English that embodies an ideal character. Though with good generalship, cricket is a game for Britons generally. See, with good generalship, scholars have looked at that phrase and has interpreted it as meaning. See, if cricketing, if cricket is properly channelized, properly, if cricket is propagated properly, not only the Englishmen, but other British nations, other British nationalities can play cricket as well. That is what makes it a sort of an imperial Englishness. Because cricket represents a form of Englishness. And that Englishness, all a wide set of realities, I'm only quoting and examining one here. And that Englishness, was considered to be something that sets it apart from not only the other races, non-white races that come later, we'll come to that in a bit, but even from, let's say the Celtic nations. So that is the point about imperial English. And in 90s England, cricket, see, the, my fundamental point, I'm, I hope you all get the context here, See, uh, cricket, see, if, if you ask any discerning spectator, uh, someone who is who pays attention to these things, even if that person is not interested in cricket as an academic subject, if someone asks them to speak about the significance, the social or cultural significance of cricket, from a broadly a humanities or social science perspective, they would say that it is, of course, it's, it has some linkages with nationalism, capitalism, the markets. It is relevant in the case of gender. All these things, it, these are obvious for a discerning spectator. In the same manner, cricket was very significant to 90s Euro England. In other words, it was a very significant aspect of the public culture of Victorian England. So one motive about cricket was that there is, it has a particular pedagogic value that cricket would inculcate a particular kind of character that would make people suitable to serve the empire well that cricket could uh, mould in imperial heroes. There's a famous quote that became very popular in England and subsequently around the world that emerged sometime in the, towards the end of the 19th century, that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Eton, the famous public school. Public school is obviously is not a government school, it's an elite school, Eton, Harrow, Rugby, these are the well known public schools. So, uh, this uh, quote ha has been attributed erroneously to the Duke of Wellington. Uh, no one knows who exactly said it, but the quote itself is very famous. That indicates that that line of thinking was very popular in Victorian England. Victorian public schools, especially gave a lot of importance to all team sports, including cricket. J. A. Mangan, James Mangan, is a remarkable scholar who has identified this philosophy, this cult known as athleticism. According to Mangan, athleticism is the idea that physical sports 
can inculcate certain moral characters. That, that might seem very commonsensical to us now. Why? Because we grew up in a world where such things as Boy Scouts and all those things are very, you know, are, are accepted things. But that began, that originated in Victorian England, Baden Powell's Boy Scout uh, movement. Athletic, athleticism is the idea that sports is vital for the molding of character. Mangan, in his book, The Games Ethic and Imperialism, has worked on the, as it's a remarkable book, he has examined the ways in which public schools insisted and insisted on and promoted team sports with the idea that 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 would create, that would, that would help them produce great heroes for the empire. This is Mangan words, Mangan's words, cricket and other team sports would create the basic tools of imperial command, courage, endurance, assertion, uh, control, and self-control. See, so uh, Mangan points out that the team sports were considered to be ideal for training imperial heroes because they would teach the young men, because men went to those schools back in those days, they were separate girls' schools, they would train the young men to be great leaders and to command those below them in the hierarchy and to be very deferential, to be very obedient to those who are higher up on the chain. So they'd be team players in that sense. So teamwork was something that was supposed to train them for that. And this idea was very current in Victorian England. It was a vital, vital part of the colonial discourse of 19th century England. That's best examined. At least some of you might have come across uh, this poem at some point, Vitae Lambada by John Henry Newbold, written in 1892. Uh, Vitae Lambada is like for they pass on the torch of life. The first stanza describes a cricket match. There's a breathless hush in the close to me. Close as in the open field in the school. Ten to make and, and the match to win. See, ten runs needed to win the match. And the last man is in. Obviously not a great batsman. An hour to play and last man in. It's not for the sake of a ribbon coat or the selfish hope of a season spring. That last man would try and win the game, but not because you know he wants the ribbon coat, the trophy kind of thing that he would get, or because he wants the accolades but because someone has given him an order, but his captain's hand on his shoulders moved, play up, play up and play the game. Just because his captain has told him to play up the game, do your best, try and win the match for our school. So the commitment towards the captain, commitment towards the school team, the second stanza refers to a desert. The sand in the desert is sodden red, red with the wreck of a square that broke. The gatling's jammed and the colonel dead. The gatling is a particular gun. And the colonel is dead. See, the reference is to many battlefields, colonial battlefields in places as far off as Africa, those days. So in a battlefield, years later, the same schoolboy would find himself in a battlefield in some part of the world. And England is far and honor a name. Right. So there, he is in another crisis situation. But the voice of a schoolboy rallies the ranks: "Play up, play up, and play the game." Right. The schoolboys, so the school, the, the training given to him in the school to play for his team would give him the courage and the spirit to fight. This thereby creating material for others. This poem was a sensation. It's one of those really influential poems. And this is not just a single, this is one among the many 
available instances of such discourses. All right. So the uh, an ideology that was closely associated with athleticism was that of muscular Christianity. Uh, muscular Christianity is the people usually associated with it are um, Charles Kingsley, the author of Water Babies, and Thomas Hughes, the author of Tom Brown's School Days. The idea was that physical education, physical culture could also make you pure or spiritual, that you could become better Christians by building up your body. All right. So um, many public schools did become influenced by the ideology of muscular Christianity. One real life example, one very, uh, very, one very important real life example is that of the rugby school. The rugby school had a legendary headmaster in Thomas Arnold, uh, the father of Matthew Arnold. He was the headmaster of the rugby school. And he did promote the idea of muscular Christianity. He did not really promote sports that much, but he did believe in spirituality and the importance of keeping your body fit. Thomas Hughes studied in the rugby school and he later wrote a novel that was a bestseller in Victorian England. It was, uh, it was a very popular work of children's literature for a long time, but now it is no longer that widely read. It's called Tom Brown's School Days, published in 1857. That text is considered to be, in a sense, the, the Bible of the link between muscular Christianity and sports. See, let me tell you this. This is a novel that headmasters would read out to the students in assemblies in schools, both in England and abroad and in the colonies. They would read out certain key passages. It was just considered to be a novel that conveyed a vital message. Tom Brown, in the novel, Tom Brown is a young boy who joins the rugby school. He is a very you know, spirited young man coming from a rural family, a rich rural family. And he is used to all the violent rural sports. And he's only interested in sports. He's not interested in matters of the mind or the spirit. In the school, he befriends a boy named Arthur, who is very sensitive, imaginative, and all that, who is very virtuous, but who is not at all, who is not at all interested in any sort of physical activity, any sort of sports. Over the course of the novel, it's a very long novel, or I, I can't speak about the whole novel right here. Over the course of the novel, they become past friends, and Tom, or both of them become very ardent cricketers and members of the, the cricket team. And Tom realizes the importance of religion, importance of education, and all that. And Arda becomes more physically active. Both of them become muscular Christians. Towards the end of the novel, there are a few lines which are widely quoted by sports study scholars. It's they are almost about the cost of the school and a cricket match is going on and Tom Brown, Arthur and a young schoolmaster are sitting on the grass watching the match. And the master says, I'm beginning to understand the game that is cricket scientifically, what a noble game it is to. Tom says it's more than a game, it's an institution. And Arthur says, yes, the birthright of British boys old and young as habeas corpus and trial by jury of British men. Very crucial lines. See, habeas corpus and trial by jury. See, the idea is that there is this notion that British Jurisprudence is the best in the world. There was a no notion of that sort among the British people of the, of the time and it spread to the colonies as well. So see, our system is so refined because we have such things as 
habeas corpus and trial by jury. Habeas corpus is a very is a cornerstone of modern jurisprudence because no one can go missing without being accounted for. That's the principle. And everyone has to be judged by a jury of his peers, trial by jury. That's supposed to be fair. So, like, just like every British citizen has a right to certain constitutional uh, safeguards, British boys, they also have the right to the great game of cricket. Then the master goes on to speak about, oh, yes, it's a great game. It teaches you to be unselfish. You play for the team. Team there becomes a synecdoche key for the whole nation. Then Tom agrees and says it's better than other games, such as hare and hounds. It's a rural uh, game which centers on hunting. See, and look what the master is saying. And then the captain of the 11, what a post is his in our school world. Almost as hard as a doctor. See, within the novel, they refer to Dr. Thomas Arnold as the doctor. They never named him, but it's based on him. Requiring skills, uh, skill and general firmness. Right. So, and a few lines, skipping a few lines, the master says, so think about it, doctor as a ruler. Perhaps ours is the only little corner of the British Empire, which is thoroughly, wisely, and strongly ruled just now. So, the captain of the 11, captain of the cricketing team, is compared to the doctor. And doctor is presented as the ideal imperial ruler. The school, and at an even micro level, the team, cricket team, becomes a synecdoche for the nation itself and for the empire itself. And these are very influential lines. All right. So I hope that training field for the empire has to be clear. Another related uh, pro is that of the civilizing mission. The idea that cricket could reform the natives and also that cricket could keep, cricket could unite the colonizers and the colonized. Look at that quote from uh, an early Tunisian travelogues by somebody named Cecil Hedla. He went on a cricketing tour. Uh, in late 1890s, he took a cricketing team to India, late 1890s. He says, first, the Honda, the missionary and the merchant, see, Honda, missionary, merchant, soldier, politician, cricketer, all these people are the part of the British colonization. And all of them are civilizing influences, but of them, the least powerful would be cricketer. Because his basic point is that all these other categories of people might alienate the natives. But cricket unites, as in India, the rulers and the rulers. It brings the people together. It provides a moral training that is more valuable than the learning of a play of Shakespeare. Think about it though. This is, this is, this is actually, you know, uh, you know, a continuation of or a deviation of the whole Macaulay's minute, Macaulay's minute argument uh, about the whole idea that literature, that European literature can civilize the natives. But here he is saying cricket is more effective in civilizing the natives. And this idea was propagated through writings, through speeches. Indian viceroys, Indian governors, sorry, British viceroys and British generals in India put promote, often they would promote, that's a bit more complicated, but they would often promote cricket in the colonies, not just in India, but also in Africa. Cricket in the colonies. And they would say that, see, this is a great game. It would make you more manly. See, natives are effeminate. The colonizers are manly. The sport would make you manly. It would make you more scientific because natives are not scientific. I to bring us all together. That's what they would say in their speeches and in their writings. And this caught on at least among certain sections of natives. An easy example would be in early 20th century Parsi narrative. Uh, Parsi is often referred to as a comprador class. Uh, straight, they were one of the first groups, first 
communities in India to take to cricket. J. Pramji Patel wrote a, wrote a book on book titled Straight Thoughts on Indian Cricket. It's mostly about by Indian cricket. He means Parsi cricket. And uh, he look at the photos, uh, the lines that I have underlined, some of the lines, we're going to read all the lines that I have underlined. See, there's this line there. He's, here, he says, the Parsi also is getting prosperity as much to the civilizing and inspiring influence of British rule. He, they perceive it very literally as something that would civilize them. All right. And, uh, you know, and this line, he says, in, the, in, this, in these lines, he says, is there is something magical about the sport which makes the Englishman forget his racial and habitual reserve. He says, usually Englishmen do not mingle with people of other races, but on the cricket field, they, you know, when they, when they are playing the Englishman's national game together, they all come together. Thus, see the whole idea of a colonial board, wherein the colonizer and the colonized come together and live in harmony. Wherein the colonizer, when there is a paternalistic relationship with the colonizer working for the betterment of the colonized, trying to civilize them. So, that was a very prominent trope in many cricketing narratives of the period. But anyone who is well up in their postcolonial uh, theory would know that it's impossible for that to be the sole attitude of the colonizers towards the colonized playing credit. And we know from Baba that prone discourse is always ambivalent, characterized equally by senses, by sense of oneness and intimacy and at the same time, anxieties of oneness. Right. So uh, the colonial discourse was ambivalent as far as cricket was concerned as well. Right alongside all these narratives about cricket, uh, bringing the rulers and the rule together, there was also this notion that cricket is an English game and only the English and one remove white men could play cricket properly. And this was reflected in policy as well. The British administrators would promote cricket. At the same time, they would create these exclusive cricketing clubs where they would only play with other white men. That scene in Lagan. In the beginning of Lagan, you have seen the movie, the beginning of Lagan, where the, uh, the British soldiers are playing a cricket match within their regiment. And they get very irritated when the ball falls outside the field. And the natives who have assembled there for some other purpose pick up the, pick up the ball. They are very irritated. And one player uh, slaps the, 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 the native. And he says, you are not supposed to touch the ball. That is very, you know, that is very credible historically. Because there was a class dimension to it. They promoted cricket among the middle class and the upper classes. But even then, that white brown difference was very important to them. And, you know, cricket was considered to be a scientific game. And Lord Harris, the governor of Bombay and a great cricketer, uh, he has famously said that it's easier for the phlegmatic Anglo-Saxon to bat in a disciplined and scientific manner than uh, the excitable Asiatics. Because he said Asiatics are excitable. It's the age-old binary of scientific West and emotional or chaotic uh, East. The ambivalence of colonial creating this colonial creating this course is best illustrated uh, in the figure of Ranjit Singhji. Rinji was an Indian prince. See, he was a prince from a small Indian kingdom named Jamnagar. And 
He had a claim to the throne, but his was not the strongest claim. But Renji went to England to study for his education, but he became a sensational cricketer, one of the greatest cricketers of all time. So initially, at every point when he was chosen to play for Oxford, later on when he was chosen to play for a county team, and later on he was chosen to play for England itself, England as an MCC team. At all these points, people objected, saying he is not an English man. But two things stood in his favor. One, he was not an ordinary Indian, he was a prince. Secondly, he was such a remarkable cricketer. So at that point, England had this very, uh, you know, very competitive series of matches, annual matches going on uh, against the Australians, which later on became the Asher series. So Renji could uphold the English pride by playing for the team. It was that good. So he was, he became, a, in one sense, he became a sensation in England. See, during when he had remarkable cricketing seasons in England. Uh, he, he was a superstar. And the Rinji team merchandise would be available in England. Imagine that. He became uh, exploited by a nascent consumer industry that was there in Victorian England. At the same time, he would never be considered equal to a white man. There are numerous writings on Renji, whether his racial otherness is highlighted. A famous line, a couple of famous quotes come from Neville Cardus, one of the most famous English cricket writers ever, who wrote in the early 20th century. He wrote, the style is the man, and Renji belonged to the land of Hazlitt's Indian jugglers, Indian jugglers that Hazlitt speaks about. The whole idea that India is a land of magic. Okay, where beauty is subtle, subtle as in not logical, not plain and unambiguous. This fundamental difference between, fundamental racial difference between uh, an English man and an Indian is highlighted there. All right. Similarly, Ted Wainwright, a uh, Yorkshire cricketer of the day, saying, it's a famous quote, Ted Renji never played a Christian stroke in his life. And this racial othering was not just limited to Indians, obviously. This is, uh, see, when uh, a West Indian team taught England in 1906, it was uh, a team consisting of white men and a few black men, because most of the team would be captained by and most of the players would be white English men who have been posted there on their children, second generation Indians. So uh, the newspapers, so the team went there and obviously they could not match up the grading standards of uh, English grading teams. So they were got a clean licking, so to speak. And the news, one newspaper carried, there were several disparaging reportages of the black men saying, uh, you know, they are uncivilized and all that. But here, this, this cartoon, was published where it features W.G. Grace, that's clearly Grace, putting a black, a, a very a black, man, black boy or a man uh, drawn with simian features, with monkey-like features. And he's put over Grace's uh, knees and he's spanking him like a schoolmaster. The idea is that the West Indian cricketers are incompetent and they are there to get a harsh lesson from the English cricketers, supposed to be by W.G. Grace. All right. So, uh, so that those discourses were ambivalent. So this, so this is how uh, cricket was related to the empire in several ways. So this is the main part of my lecture. Uh, I also have something on the post-colonial writing back, uh, but this is the bare minimum that I have to do. So uh, so what do the organizers say? Shall we, should we wind up here and invite questions? So because it's seven o'clock now, or shall I speak for another five to 10 minutes, quickly go through some, some amount of 
post colonial period in cultures and then wind up, it's entirely up to you. I am flexible. Yes, sir, you can go ahead. Okay. So I'll quickly uh, go through some amount of writing back. See, because it'd be a crime not to mention C.L.R. James. C.L.R. James was a Trinidadian uh, Marxist philosopher, Marxist thinker and writer, uh, who's uh, considered to be one of the first ever writers to come out of, English writers to come out of the West Indies. James, wrote this cricketing memoir in 1964 called Beyond a Boundary, which is considered to be easily, to be arguably the best cricketing book ever written. Beyond a Boundary deserves several lectures uh, devoted, to it, devoted to it, but so I can't even come close to doing uh, justice uh, to it. But then, uh, see, the central idea of Beyond the Boundary is that James himself says the whole purpose of this book is to raise this question. What do they know of cricket? Only cricket know. It's not just wordplay. What he's saying is that if you only know the sport and the game, if you only know it as a game, you don't really know the game because there is so much more to it. See, the whole that statement challenges the idea that cricket is some sort of a cultural phenomenon with no connection to, polit connection to politics, that it's just a game, that it that you should not mix sport with politics to try and keep something apolitical itself is a political move as all students of culture is known. So, uh, C.L.A. James speaks about how cricket was embraced by the Caribbeans, about how for them, it was a means of asserting their individuality, their racial pride. The Caribbean, see, Caribbean, see, uh, those who follow cricket would know that there was this period, this long period of Caribbean dominance of world cricket. And all those players, they were politically motivated as well. They were actually combating racism. They saw the sport as a means of upholding their pride as human beings and as black men. There is a rich pressure of Caribbean literature which works along this theme of writing back. So, uh, you know, and a lot of those gems are available in this anthology. The bowling was super fine. Western the writing and Western cricket. One famous work is Prospero Caliban Cricket, a poem by uh, John Agard. Goes Prospero batting Caliban bowling. He colonized the batting and he colonized bowling. He is cricket, he is cricket in your recatics, but from far it looked like politics. See, it looks like cricket, but it's actually a political act. And, uh, you know, Prospero, uh, you know, does not really fear Caliban's bowling capability. He, uh, you know, takes him lightly. But he invokes the name of W.G. Grace to preserve him. And Caliban asks the ball like an unpredictable whip. Prospero put it like chained to the ground. Before they could make a move, the ball go, go through to the slip and the way the crowd rocking, you would think they're crossing the Atlantic. See, that whole gameplay, the physical grammar of the gameplay here is described using imagery relating to the history of slavery. The whip, whip used by the overseers in plantations in the Caribbean, whip used against slaves and endangered laborers. 
So now Caliban is building the web in the form of the ball. Prospero put it like a chain to the ground, just like the uh, slaves were chained during the middle passage to the ship. And the way the crowd rock while enjoying the game, you think they are closing, crossing the Atlantic. See, throughout, there is a lot of Caribbean poetry which invokes imagery related to the history of plantation, plantation slavery and indentured labor. Next poem, Professor David Dabdeen in the crease. It, he says, Rohan Kanai, he compares David Dabdeen's writing and academic work to Rohan Kanai's, the Western batsman Rohan Kanai's batting. And he says he's aware that there might be, who knows, there might be ships in the deep and cane field odysseys in the outfield. The major links cricket with the history of the empire. So they are writing back. See, whereas cricket was once a colonial sport that conveyed the ideology of the empire, these poets, and I, I'm ju just giving you the example of Roger, uh, sorry, John Agar, but there are many others like him. Many of them are available in their anthology. There is a lot of writing back. All right. So, uh, and uh, subsequently, cricket, resulted in cricket, the power dynamics of world cricket itself changed from 1980s onwards. Whereas England continue, England and Australia continue to dominate the International Cricket Council, even well into the 1970s. BCCI started becoming powerful from 1980s onwards. The, after India's 83 World Cup victory, BCCI took the help of Pakistan and later on Sri Lanka to try and host the 87 World Cup and 96 World Cup in the subcontinent. Back in those days, the ICC regulations, National Cricket uh, Council regulations, permitted and provided for a veto power to the founding members, which are England and Australia. So for the 87 World Cup and the 96 World Cup on both occasions, the subcontinental team they, there was a bidding process for hosting rights, depending upon how, how much money you can guarantee to the individual teams. The subcontinental team, subcontinental, the subcontinental group, Asian group, presented uh, far more attractive, financially attractive uh, packages on both these occasions. And England, England and Australia tried to veto their package, their bid, saying we have the veto power. So if we vote together, it has to go, it has to go to either England or Australia. But on both these occasions, these teams fought a legal battle. They, uh, you know, tussled or they brought in lawyers and argued over what various clauses mean. And ultimately, the both, both, both on both these occasions, the decisions went in favor of the subcontinental team. And ultimately, in the 1990s, they managed to do away with the veto. And uh, I'll just end with this point because uh, you know, it will become too long if I go into the nitty-gritties of, of the next line of thought. See, in contemporary cricket, India, or rather BCCI, holds more sway in cricket administration than any other nation, including the West, including Western nations. Simply because the statistics vary, but 70 to 80 percent of world's cricketing revenue comes from India. That is mainly because because the size of the Indian market. No demography watches cricket as. Uh, you know, as in such mass, uh, such uh, such large numbers as Indians. That may change, by the way. The, the, the viewing cultures are changing a little bit. But still, if you have ever wondered why India is able to 
create a separate calendar, separate slot in the ICC calendar of IPL. So because of this financial clout. So there is a lot of academic work which speaks about the fact that India is now the leader of world cricket and not a subaltern anymore. So uh, this is where I conclude. See, so what does this quick journey through the history of cricket over the past couple of centuries tell us? It tells us that cricket is relevant to a lot of cultural contexts. So how can we study all these societies without studying something like cricket? How can we uh, say we have, we have covered the tour in literature without paying a certain, without, I'm not saying, you know, even, I, even if I was involved in something like this, I wouldn't fill syllabus with cricket text. That's not the idea. But just like, see, these days, no one would imagine teaching Australian literature without teaching, without including something about the stolen generation or Caribbean literature with no reference to the middle passage. It's like that. There are many contexts which cannot be and should not be taught without reference to sporting cultures. And in every domain, and it's not always sport. And in every domain, there are various cultural formations that are very significant, which should be incorporated very organically and creatively into our curriculum. And that, to the best of my understanding, is what a cultural turn is all about. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. I hope it was of some use. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions or listen to any comments. Thank you so much, sir. It's really thoughtful. And uh, yeah, anyone if any have, I mean, anyone has any question, please ask, sir, in the chat box also. Yes, Arundhati, you can unmute yourself and just ask. Good evening, sir. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, it is it is rather exhilarating to uh, relate uh, the literature and study and know the literature of sports, cricket especially. So, sir, um, uh, even though your uh, talk was very enlightening, one uh, doubt still remains, looms over me, that uh, in a country like India, where we have tried so hard to, you know, stick to our native culture in terms of social or economic uh, background, so uh, what made the sport a stand out of it? I mean, we embrace the sport of the colonized uh, colonizers. Ah, yes. Okay. See, uh, obviously, um, the whole point of my this thing was that uh, researching cricket is not about celebrating cricket. That's not what it is about at all. Uh, and uh, see, uh, the, the simple answer to your question has been answered uh, very well by a scholar named Shadad Rusen. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Uh, he has a couple of articles where, where he has spoken about the fact that, see, cricket became a sensation because it got associated with the nation. And that happened because of a particular historical contiguity. Historical contiguity. Sorry, historical contiguity because uh, it is in the 1980s it is, as a, uh, it is as an aftermath of the uh, holding of uh, Asian Games in India uh, that we developed a nationwide TV network. Around that time, the fortunes of Indian hockey declined. Hockey used to, used to be a sport that we are good at. Used to be a sport in which we used to defeat other nations. Around that time, hockey declined. And uh, you know the Indian public were able to witness very humiliating defeats in hockey live. Around the same time, they could all, they were also able to watch uh, cricketing triumphs such as the 1983 World Cup victory and 85 Benson had just a victory live. So that led to a scenario 
wherein cricket replaced hockey or any other possible sport as that sport which would be exploited by the uh, consumer market in order to create a sort of corporate nationalism. So it is that historical contiguity that made it into the uh, you know, de facto national sport in India. So there is something special about cricket that makes it you know, a very popular game in India. It's just a historical quantity. And see, and as far as the whole native thing is concerned, uh, you know, see, culture is evolved. Uh, there is no reason why uh, we should not, you know, be interested in a sport that is originally not Indian. That is not the point. But then the question, the, the task of a scholar is to always question the power structures that are involved in it. There is no cultural formation that is always already progressive. Or always already problematic. It is our job to keep on probing these hierarchies. That made any sense. Yes, sir. So, so hockey and kabaddi, in a way, fell prey to consumerism and capitalism, just like everything yes, else yes. in postmodern world. The, the attempt to attempt to create a pro uh, hockey league, a kabaddi league. All these are, you know, now they are trying to follow the cricket paradigm. So yeah, the cricket complex, we are trying to come out of it. Yes, see, and, and you know, see, it's like, uh, you know, cricket, the, the story is obviously a bit more complicated because uh, there is also a lot of history of governments, the elected governments patronizing cricket because it's a sort of, see, we look at it in Gramscian terms, it's an aspect of popular culture that also, also enjoys a certain amount of official status. So yeah. all these things, so, the, so there is nothing natural about cricket that makes it special, but there are a lot of cultural reasons. But it also follows that if something is cultural, that is not set in stone. It can yes. change and evolve. Yeah, or ever evolving, yes. Yes, sir, thank you. Sure, sure. my pleasure. Uh, anyone else can ask anything? Um, I think that due to unfavorable weather, many of them uh, just left the meeting. Oh, that's all. In, that's yeah. So we can go for the vote of thanks. Uh, is it okay? Uh, let, me just, let me just say that it's been a real pleasure uh, to be here. Very thankful to Kalyani ma'am and the CSRO for inviting me here. Uh, you know, it's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, just go for the formal vote of thanks. Angeline, are you there, dear? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes, please go ahead. Happy playful evening, everyone. I'm Angeline from, from an online batch of Valatez. It has been such a privilege to be a part of this imposing event. As a representative of Culture Study Research Forum, I would be delighted to extend my wholehearted gratitude to our dignified guest, Dr. Rakesh Ramurthy. Honestly, a bunch of thanks to you, sir, for apprising us with your profound knowledge on this adequate field of cricket narratives with a research perspective that unwrap various concepts for learners like us. It's such a pleasure to listen to you throughout the session. We would definitely look forward to gather more from you in the upcoming discourses. We hope you would like it too. And now I would love to thank with all sincerity to the patron of Wallet test, Dr. Kalyani Wallet, who is behind our all enthusiasm and to my CSRF team, and also to our whole test team. A wide round of applause and thanks to all the participants who made the event a memorable one. I would like to thank all of you present here for making the time to be with us today and helping us make this event a grand success. Thank you one and all. Don't forget to follow 
SS newsletter for getting new research areas. Now it's time to conclude today's session. Have a great evening ahead. See you and keep learning. And never forget the motto of our wallet is the best is yet to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. So we are ending the session.